Greetings and welcome to part two of this video series in which we discuss how amplifiers work from an electrical standpoint. In part one we talked about the primary circuit here, uh, 120 volt 60 cycle. We talked about the 5 volt filament circuit, the 6 volt filament circuit, and the high voltage circuit that produced the 325 volts of direct current that we were going to send up to the rest of the chassis of the amplifier. Let's pick up where we left off. Okay, now we're going to pick up where we left off with the 320 volts DC. This is what we found, our B+. And it looks like this, a bunch of little humps side by side, all the positive humps. We're going to send it two ways. First, some of it's going to go up here through the primary winding of the output transformer. And then it's going to come over here to the plate of the 6V6. Now earlier I said that when the electrons are boiled off of the cathode down here like popcorn, we want to have a strong vacuum up here to really attract them. And nothing attracts negative electrons more than a nice positive 320 volts of direct current on this plate. Now, I think you can see that. We've established a really strong vacuum here for the electrons that are leaving the cathode. Secondly, we've accomplished something by sending it through this coil. Now, we're not sending this direct current. Remember, it can't pass through the transformer, but the coil will act to smooth out these humps. The humps will be resisted somewhat and smoothed out. It's sort of like we're taking some of the kinks out of those of the humps here in the, the ripple of the direct current. So we're smoothing it out and sending it to our plate. Remember, uh, whatever didn't go up above, we're going to send over in this direction. Now, we're going to have a filter capacitor. Uh, in this case, I think it's 16 microfarads. And what that will do, uh, I have a separate video on filter capacitors that you might want to look at, and it explains how it's going to do this. But it's going to smooth out the ripple. Then we run it through a resistor, and that also smooths out the ripple. So look, here, big pronounced humps, but the filter capacitor and the resistor smooth it out to where the ripple is not nearly as bad. Let's put another filter capacitor and another even higher resistor here and now we've got that uh, B plus or the high voltage direct current very smooth and flat here with no ripple hardly to speak of. Just to play it safe let's put another filter capacitor okay so we have a total of three. And you notice what they're doing. They're compressing that rippling down to where we get a nice, flat, smooth, direct current. And we're going to send that up here to the plates of the 12AX7. Remember, there's two of them. Because the 325 volts has gone through one, two, three resistors, one for each plate here, and these are 100K. It's dropped down now to about 150 volts DC. It has the same purpose to be like a vacuum for the electrons here that come off of the cathode, but uh, in a preamp tube, there's not as many electrons and there's not as ne uh, a need for as much vacuum, if you will, so we run them at a lower voltage. Also, we have to have an absolutely smooth uh, 150 volts of DC or else it'll be very noisy. Your preamp tubes are very, very prone to, uh, if there's any noise, it will be amplified over and over again and come out where it's really a racket coming out the speaker, a buzz, a hum, or something like that. So you want to have extremely clean direct current coming in here to the plates. And that's why we weren't so fussy with the plate of the 6V6, but we ran through three capacitors and three resistors to really filter that direct current for the plates of our 12AX7. 
Okay, just a quick review then. Our high voltage um, comes up uh, to this stage with all sorts of ripple and it is sent through the primary of the output transformer to smooth out a lot of the ripple and then sent to the plate of the 6V6 and then it's filtered through three separate filtering stages to get it really smooth and really flat and then it's fed into the plates of the 12AX7. Now this is the final diagram and uh, I have the high voltage uh, still marked in orange here and we're going to take a look at our guitar signal and we're going to feed it in now and this will be the final circuit of the amp and that is what is the guitar signal circuit in an amplifier and how does it end up coming in here with just uh, a bare fluttering of of strings and end up over here blasting till the neighbors call the police. Okay, something really important is going to happen in here and I think we have all the building blocks to understand how that happens. But first let's take a look at how a guitar generates that signal and what the signal looks like. What is its magnitude? How many volts is it? And what is its frequency? Okay, let's measure the voltage of the output signal of a guitar. No amplifiers involved here. It's strictly the pickups of the guitar connected to a voltmeter. I'm going to turn the voltmeter to alternating current, strike a few chords, and see what kind of readings we get. Okay, the highest I saw was 0.78 volts. So let's say that the output from the guitar is around 0.8 volts of alternating current. Let's take the A string here, for example. When it's plucked in the open position, it vibrates back and forth at 110 cycles per second. As it vibrates back and forth over the magnet that is located beneath it in each pickup, it will generate within that pickup an alternating current signal of 110 cycles per second. It will leave the pickup, go to the amplifier through the cable, and uh, there the amplitude of that signal will be greatly increased. Okay, now that we know what the guitar signal looks like, uh, let's feed it in here to our circuit. Uh, here's our guitar signal. And as you notice, it's a very small little weak signal at 0.8 volts of alternating current at 110 cycles per second because that is the A string. We're going to feed it in over here to our input jack. We run it through a 68K ohm resistor largely to cut down on feedback. And we feed it into the grid of the 12AX7. Now I've split the 12AX7 apart just like I took a chainsaw and cut it down the middle. It just makes it easier to understand if I move the two halves apart. Okay, they're absolutely identical. So we're going to feed into the grid here of the left half of the 12AX7. Now remember that the popcorn, the electrons, are boiling off the cathode just boiling vigorously off of the cathode. And we've been kind of tricky here in that we've created our fence, our grid, to where it effectively blocks most of the electrons. The way we do that is we charge the grid negative. The electrons come boiling off of the cathode, all excited, looking for some place to go. They say, oh my lord, look here, ugh, a negatively charged fence how repulsive, and they're repelled back down into the tube. They don't pass through. So by negatively charging the grid, uh, and that's the way when we talk about grid biasing, that's how it's done, is we give this a negative charge. It's like an electric fence to repel the electrons and keep them under control. Now up here, remember, we have a 150 volt, a volt DC uh, vacuum that wants to really uh, absorb every electron that that cathode can give off. But this pesky grid is interfering with that. Now what happens next is 
I'm going to make a really crude analogy here. But imagine that if you went out to your tire on your car and you took off the valve uh, cover cap off the stem. Uh, now inside you have, what, 30, 35 pounds of air. Now imagine that every air molecule in your tire is an electron. And you're going to go out in the garage and you're going to touch the valve, just uh, touch it very lightly with like a little pin or a needle. And all of a sudden a blast of electrons are going to, or air molecules, are going to come out of the tire. Well imagine that that's exactly what's happening here. When the guitar signal comes in here, it's going to alter that negative charge on the grid. And it's going to alternately sort of open and close the grid in the rhythmic fashion exactly the way the string was vibrating. And we're going to say open, close, open, close, open, close. And we're going to each time that we that the guitar signal hits and alters the charge here of the grid, millions of electrons are going to come flowing out of that cathode and blasting into the plate. And they're not just going to do it just uh, like in an overwhelming blast. Oh no, they're going to be modulated exactly like the guitar string. So if I have the guitar signal looking like this, then on my plate, suddenly I'm going to get big blasts of electrons. Oh, no electrons. Oh, huge blast of electrons. And as you can see, the tiny signal that I applied to my grid becomes a huge signal over here on my plate as a million electrons slip through for every, say, 10 or 20 electrons that pass through as part of my guitar signal. I hope that makes some sense. Now here remember the rule that DC and AC can coexist in the same wire. So we've got 150 volts DC here creating our vacuum and our plate, but we have our signal. Remember that great big signal that we have because the grid was modulated a little bit and let millions of electrons come blasting through exactly in rhythm with our guitar string? Here comes that signal. And it comes out and comes over here. And the last thing I want to do is apply 150 volts to the grid of the second stage of my 12AX7. It would just destroy it. So let's put a capacitor here. Now this is what a coupling capacitor is. We've all heard of them. Well, this is what they do. Remember the rule that alternating current, which is the guitar signal, can pass on through. Direct current, boom, it hits a brick wall right here, it cannot proceed. So this capacitor keeps all of the direct current on the plate and it's sort of like the bouncer at the club when the guitar signal, which is amplified now much larger than it was, tries to come up here, the capacitor says, oh, go right on through. Come over here and let's put a volume control in. Let's have some variable resistance here so that we can control how loud our signal is. Then let's feed it into the grid of the second uh, stage here of the 12AX7. And exactly the same thing happens, except even more so. Because we're going to tilt the valve stem a whole bunch now with this high signal it's coming through. And when we tilt that valve stem a whole bunch, even more air molecules, or in our analogy, electrons, are going to come blasting through from the cathode and into the plate, so we're going to have an even greater signal. Now down here I've drawn sort of, and this is really crude, but let's look at our guitar signal. We can barely see it. It's really wimpy down here. Then after the first stage of amplification, you notice that we've got a whole lot more amplitude to our signal. Our second stage of amplification, we've got a whole lot more amplitude. And then we're going to use a coupling capacitor here to keep the DC on the plate. And we're going to let this much larger signal pass through. And we're going to feed it into the grid of our 6V6 tube. 
Now this is where big things are going to really start happening. This is the power amp part of the amplifier. And let's look, look up here. 320 volts of DC on this plate. Don't you think that this tube is capable then of a whole lot more amplification than either of the stages of the 12AX7 with their measly little 150 volts? Okay, uh, so we're going to heat up this cathode and we're going to get 5,000 pounds of popcorn popping down here and we've got a 320 volt DC vacuum up here trying to suck it through and we've got a really strong signal coming in here and really pressing that valve stem and really uh, allowing all sorts of electrons to pass through. Huge hundreds of millions of electrons are streaming through to create a huge signal. Now that signal we're going to send out along with, remember the 320 volts of DC is present here, the signal can coexist with it. Remember the rule, they both can coexist in the same wire. Here comes the signal. Now that's a transformer. Remember about transformers. This is the output transformer. DC can't pass through, can it? But here comes an alternating signal. Alternating current signal is coming through and this is just like the bouncer at the club. It says, oh, an alternating signal from the guitar, and look how nice and big it is, and lets it pass straight through to the speaker. Now the guitar signal has been amplified way up to around 300 or 320 volts, but at a very low current level. It's only around 0.035 amps. That's 35 milliamps. So it's a very high voltage low current signal which doesn't work well with speakers so the output transformer is going to do what transformers do and it's going to transform this from a high voltage low current signal into a relatively low voltage high current signal it's going to change the 0.035 amps into something more like 2.5 amps and it's going to drop the, say, 320 volt signal down to around 5 volts. Now these numbers are, are really rough, but they're sort of in the ballpark. Okay, so we're going to feed that then to our voice coil of our speaker, and we're going to allow the guitar signal, remember, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, to push and pull by changing the polarity on the voice coil which is inside of a magnet. It's either repelled by the magnet, attracted by the magnet, repelled, attracted, and the speaker cone will move back and forth with exactly the same pattern of motion as the vibrations of the guitar string that we started with in the beginning. Except it's going to be doing so with a much greater force behind it because of the amplification that's taken place. The 0 0.8 volt AC signal that we put in, that pitiful, weak little vibrating string, has now produced a very powerful signal up around 2.5 or 3 amps to drive the speaker cone. Well, Rusty, are you thoroughly thrilled with the video so far? No, guess not. Now for a study in contrast, let's just feed the output from the guitar directly into a speaker to see what our puny little 0 0.8 volt output signal uh, does with the speaker. Absolutely no sound whatsoever. The speaker just laughs at this puny signal. Now let's run that puny little signal through the Champ guitar chassis that we've been studying. And for a little change of pace, I'm going to hand the guitar over to Rusty and let him play us a, a little tune.
Wow, not too bad, Rusty. Looks like chasing tennis balls isn't your only talent. Well, that about does it for this two-part video series in which we investigate the mysterious goings-on in an amplifier chassis. All those weird voltages and different types of current. Uh, hopefully now we have a pretty good working understanding of how the chassis functions from an electrical standpoint and how it changes the laughable puny guitar signal into something that can make your neighbors cringe in horror. Uh, I really appreciate the time you spent watching the videos. I hope you will subscribe if you haven't already. But most of all, I hope you stay tuned. Thanks so much. Bye for now.